Wow, look at all these beautiful historic airplanes. You know what they all have in common, John? Yeah, they're all just beautiful. Well, that's definitely true, but it's not what I had in mind. They're all tail draggers. Well, Martha, why don't you tell us about tail draggers? Well, I go fly a few of them. Sounds like fun. The thing about tail draggers is the main wheels are in front and the tail's on the ground. In the early days of aviation, almost all airplanes were configured this way, with either a skid or a steerable tailwheel in back. They can be called tailwheel airplanes or conventional gear airplanes, but I like to call them tail draggers. The important thing to know about tail draggers is that although they handle just the same as other airplanes in the air, they do handle differently as soon as you touch the ground. And this means they require a different set of skills. The reason they handle differently on the ground is that the main wheels are so far forward. This means that if a pilot touches down a little hard with extra speed, the airplane tends to pitch back up in the air again. Also, directional control on the ground is more difficult. When the airplane is turning while taxiing, it pivots around the main wheels. And since most of the weight is behind the main wheels, the tail can really get to swinging. Pilots have to work hard to keep the airplane taxiing in a straight line. Okay, let's check in with John now while he shows what it's like to taxi a tail dragger in Flight Simulator. Well, first of all, it's hard to see over the nose in a tail dragger, but there are two things we can do. We can press shift enter to raise the seat up as high as we can. And we can always return the seat to its original position by pressing spacebar. Or we can use W to cycle through windshield views with less and less of the panel. Also, we can use our rudder pedals to S-turn from side to side so we can see ahead of the airplane. Now, you can operate the rudder pedals by twisting the joystick or by using key commands. The key command for left rudder is zero on the number pad, and for right rudder, it's enter on the number pad. Now, sometimes when you're taxiing slowly, it helps to use differential brakes to start a turn. So, use F11 for left brake and F12 for right brake. Also, if you're taxiing in a crosswind, you'll have to work those rudders and brakes a lot to keep the airplane going straight. Now let's talk about your takeoff. Of course, you'll start your takeoff run in a nose-high three-point attitude. As your speed increases, you'll raise the tail to streamline the aircraft into the wind. Then when you have flying speed, you lower the tail to put the airplane in a climb attitude and it will fly off the runway on its own. Now let's take a look at it from the cockpit view. Okay, let's give it a try. As we pick up speed, we'll push forward slightly on the stick to raise the tail. And as we raise the tail, we might need to add a little right rudder to help counteract the airplane's natural left turning tendency. We have flying speed, so we'll pull back on the stick slightly to climb attitude. And we are airborne. That was a nice takeoff, John. But now let's talk about the part that worries everybody, landing the airplane. There are two basic pitch attitudes you can use for landing, nose high or level. The nose high attitude is used most commonly on smaller tail draggers, and it has you land at the slowest possible speed. This is called a three-point landing because usually all three wheels will touch the ground at the same time. It's a beautiful feeling when you do it right. Let's have John show us. All right, we do this by flying level just above the ground. Then we slowly keep bringing the stick back and hold the airplane off the ground. Hold it off, hold it off. And just as the stick reaches the back limit of travel, the airplane touches down to a nice, soft landing. Now, as we slow down, the controls become less and less effective, so it will take bigger and bigger control movements to keep the airplane going straight. It's a lot of fun. On the other hand, it's not uncommon to land bigger tail draggers 
with what's known as a wheel landing. In a wheel landing, you touch down at a higher speed, in a level attitude, and on the mains only. Just as you touch, you add a little bit of forward stick to keep the airplane from pitching back up into the air. Okay, let's give it a try. Well, we're getting close to the ground now, so we'll level off just above the ground. And this time, instead of adding back pressure, we'll just fly level and let the mains touch the ground. Okay, we touched and I added a little forward stick. And we just made a nice, smooth wheel landing. Now, as the airplane slows down, we'll gently lower the tailwheel to the ground. You know what? I just can't decide whether I like wheel landings or three-point landings the best. Well, John, now that these people know how to handle a tail dragger and flight simulator, don't you think it's time for them to try it on their own? <laughs> You're right, Martha. In fact, I'd like to practice some more myself. Besides, I still have to decide what kind of landing I like best. <laughs> Let's all go flying. Hey, Martha, I'm cleared for takeoff on my flight, and I just discovered this new GPS in flight simulator. I've only got a minute, but can you show me how to use it? Well, that's a pretty sophisticated unit, but take a look over here, and let's see if I can give you a quick tour. I'd hate to see you get lost again. First, press Shift 3 to bring up the GPS. Now you know where you are on the map. See? Right here at Montgomery Field in San Diego. Well, I already know where I am. I just don't know how to get where I'm going. Well, that's easy. The first thing to know is that there are pages and groups. Pages have different kinds of information on them, and groups are collections of similar pages. Now, to get around in the unit, you need to use these knobs. They're really easy to understand once you see how they're used. The outer knob, the big knob, controls big things, like the groups of pages. The inner knob, the smaller knob, controls little things, like pages within that group. And some of the buttons help get you to more frequently used pages quickly, too. When you push the middle of the inner knob, you go into the page and turn on the cursor. That's called the cursor mode. Now, the outer knob will move you around the page, and the inner knob allows you to change things. Now, now, wait a minute. I didn't get any of that, and I am still not ready to depart on my flight. That's okay. It makes more sense to see it in action. Here's how to get set up for your flight. First, using the mouse, press the direct button. When you press the direct button, you don't need to press the cursor button. Next, rotate the inner knob with one click, like this. Then use the keyboard to type in the airport identifier. But Martha... Hang on a second, John. Now click the enter button on the GPS until the activate function field is highlighted. And click one more time to activate it. But Martha... There, you're all set. Now you see your course line and all kinds of information about where you are and where you're going. Well, that's all just fine, Martha, but there is one small problem. That's not the airport I was going to fly to. I was just planning to hop over to Gillespie Field. Well, then this is just the unit for you. It's really easy to change your mind and your destination in the GPS. Let's have you do it this time. First, press the nearest button. Here's a list of the closest airports to you. Press the cursor button and then turn the outer knob to scroll down to your airport, KSEE Gillespie. Now click the direct button, then click enter twice to confirm your selection. Then click and hold the clear button to get to the nav page. There, your new course line is drawn and all the important information about your flight path is displayed. Hey, that's pretty neat, but look at all these lines and stuff on the map. I can't tell what I'm looking at. Simple. Just press the clear button. Each time you press it, some information disappears, which declutters the screen. You can also press the range buttons to zoom in and out. And you can use the inner knob to move between the nav pages for your flight. Each page shows you different kinds of information you'll need. Very nice. You know, I'm feeling more oriented with every minute. I'll never be lost again. 
don't know. Hey John, here in the Learning Center, I just found out there are a lot of ways to change your views and how you see things in Flight Simulator. I notice that right now you're not using the full screen. I think you'll find Flight Simulator more fun if you do use the full screen. You can toggle it on or off by pressing Alt-Enter. Okay. And if you want to toggle the Windows menu bar on or off, you can just press Alt. Okay, let me give that a try. John, did you know you can see yourself the way a person in the control tower or in another airplane can see you? Well, Martha, I found the same thing right here on the kneeboard while I was flying. Look at this. The W key lets me cycle among the different ways I see through the windshield. I start with the view that shows both the panel and the windshield. And then when I press W, I see just the windshield with the instruments across the bottom. And if I press W again, the instruments go away. And pressing W once more takes me back to the original view. Now, if I press Shift W, I cycle through those views in reverse order. Well, I guess you could think of the W key as changing how much of the windshield you look through. That's very good, Martha. I'll remember W for windshield. John, did you know you can use the S key to change the way you see the cockpit and yourself? I saw that in the kneeboard, but let me give it a try. When I press S, I get the virtual cockpit view. I can see a lot more of the cockpit and in 3D. John, it says here in the Learning Center that when you're in the virtual cockpit mode, you can use the hat switch to look around the cockpit. Okay, let me give that a try. When I move the hat switch back, it's like I tilted my head to look down. When I move the hat switch forward, it's like I tilted my head to look up. And everything works the same way for looking left or right. Now here's something else that's interesting. On any of these views, you can zoom in for a closer look by pressing the plus key and zoom out by pressing the minus key. And any time you've used the hat switch to look around, you can snap right back to the original position by pressing the space bar. Neat. Now I'll press S again to cycle to the next way of seeing things. Here I'm seeing myself the way a local air traffic controller would see me from the tower. When I press S again, I get to see myself the way another airplane would see me. And I can move that other airplane around with the hat switch or the number pad. And when I press S again, I go back to the original view. And again, if I press Shift S, I cycle through those views in reverse order. Well, I guess you could think of the S key as changing the way you see. Oh, that's very good, Martha. I've got it. I use the W key to change the way I look out the windshield and I use the S key to change the way I see the cockpit of my own airplane and myself in flight. That's good. And John, here's another way you can change the way things look to you. You can move your seat around. Well, that's right, Martha. I can shift my seat up and down with the shift key. If I press shift enter, I'm raising my seat. And if I press shift backspace, I'm lowering my seat. So in this case, you can think of using the shift key as shifting your seat up and down. Martha, if that works for you, it works for me. You know, as helpful as your little memory tricks are, I still always have the kneeboard while I'm flying. So I really don't have to memorize all this stuff. For instance, when I want to display the radio stack, I can look on the kneeboard to find what to do. I can press shift two or I could click on this handy little antenna icon. And by pressing Shift 3 or clicking on this icon, I can pull up my satellite navigation receiver or GPS, which then I can reposition with the mouse. Martha, you are an absolute wealth of information. It's not me, John. All this information is right here in the Learning Center. You haven't been doing so bad yourself. Well, I guess it's not me either, Martha, because I've been using the kneeboard. And what I've learned from all of this is that Flight Simulator gives you a lot of fun ways to view things. One of the neat things about Flight Simulator is how it allows you to use the radios just the way you would if you were going on a trip in an airplane. Now to display the radio stack, you can just click on this handy little antenna icon or press Shift 2. 
Now at the top of the stack you'll find the radio selection panel. Just click on the buttons to turn on the radios that you want to use. You'll notice you have two communications radios. You can choose either COM1 or COM2 or both. Selecting both lets you transmit on COM1 and listen to both. This is really handy when you want to listen to the tape recorded information about the airport called Automatic Terminal Information Service, or ATIS for short, without missing any calls from air traffic control. You also have two navigation radios for receiving VORs or an ILS. Plus, you also have marker beacons, DME, and ADF to help you with your navigation. You can learn more about these by clicking on Flying Lessons. Flight Simulator will tune to most frequencies automatically, but you can always make your own choice. You can look up the frequencies you might want to use by checking out the airport information or going to the map. To change a frequency, move your cursor to the number you want to change. If you move the cursor to the left side of the window, you'll see a minus sign and clicking on the mouse button will give you smaller numbers. Move the cursor to the right side and you'll get a plus sign and bigger numbers when you click. Finally, to activate the frequency, just click on the double arrow. By the way, you can use this same technique in Flight Simulator anytime you want to change a number in a window, such as when you want to change the altitude set in your autopilot. Now that you know how to operate the radio stack, the next thing you'll need to do is practice your captain's voice. <laughs>